covered already, um, biomarkers of aging are really useful proxies that can be used in a, in a number of different applications. So number one, which we're mostly talking about today is in clinical trial endpoints. So rather than having to do a clinical trial that lasts 10, 20, potentially 50 years, if we actually did have good proxies for the biological aging of some uh, tissue or cell type, we could use these to represent what we think the mortality or morbidity effect might be. Um, another application is just in better understanding of the basic biology of aging. Um, and then finally, in risk stratification. So looking at populations, identifying at-risk people, whether that's um, for recruitment into different interventions um, or just better monitoring. So the goal of these biomarkers of aging um, are first, you know, most simply just to differentiate someone who's 20 years old from someone who's eight year old. Um, but probably more importantly is among people who are the same chronological age, can we differentiate people who are accelerated agers versus those who are decelerated agers? So people are aging faster than we would expect. And then finally um, is to actually look at modifiability. So can we actually intervene in the aging process and actually assess whether um, some specific intervention uh, is actually um, effective in slowing the aging process. So next. Um, so when thinking about actually measuring biological age for a clinical trial or basic research, um, there's actually a number of different, what we might call biological levels at which you could measure biological age. So I, we actually think that aging probably starts as some of these lowest levels of biological organization, so at the molecule level, and actually propagates up. And really what we see at the organismal level is kind of the emergence of the changes that are happening at these lower levels. So technically you could actually measure biological age at any of these levels and, and which one you pick actually might depend on um, what the question you're asking is. So next. So in developing biomarkers, I think I kind of want to focus on four major goals uh, for this talk. So first validity, reliability, modifiability, and finally mechanism focused biomarkers. Next. So starting with validity. So what does this mean? Is um, one big issue in actually developing biomarkers of aging is that age is a latent con aging is a latent concept. It's actually something we can't observe. And so anything we do is not gonna have a ground truth for which we can evaluate it. So Steve already did a really great job at kind of discussing the first generation versus second generation epigenetic clocks. So again, these first generation clocks and a lot of biomarkers of aging, even beyond the ones developed in uh, using DNA methylation are developed as what we call chronological age predictors. So you get thousands to potentially hundreds of thousands of variables. Um, you do either some uh, machine learning or deep learning technique to see if you can actually predict the chronological age of a sample. So um, one issue with these types of clocks in actually applying them either for clinical trial use or for monitoring health and aging is that in training these, they actually, the algorithm may not prioritize the most critical um, biomarkers for health outcomes, for mortality risk. And that was pretty well demonstrated actually in the epigenetic clocks where we found that the ones that are actually trained not on chronological age ended up being better predictors of the outcomes that we're most interested in. Um, so some reasons why this might happen is that you actually might be adjusting out some of the things that create differences, biological differences among people the same age. So obviously if the algorithm is trying to get the best predictor of chronological age, it might actually um, re reverse weight some of the things that differentiate people the same age. Um, another issue is uh, mortality selection. So if you're getting very accurate age predictions for people who are 80, 90, or 100, those are probably not biomarkers that actually have an impact on mortality because people who are 90 or 100 are not some random subset of the original birth cohort. They're actually the most resilient selective people. So they actually should be predicted younger than they are. And if you're getting good age predictions in them, you're probably not measuring things that actually have an impact on mortality. Um, so this is kind of where 
we came in with what we call these second generation measures. So can we actually measure things um, like, or actually predict things like phenotypic aging or some proxy for biological aging and develop biomarkers for them? So we think that by doing this, we'll actually be capturing more important information. Um, but there are a few drawbacks. So number one, it's a lot easier to get a huge uh, sample for training if your outcomes age. Age is really easy to measure. Um, so most of the data available for making these second generation clocks is gonna be a lot smaller. And then the other issue is that it's not entirely clear what our outcome actually should be and whether we should combine a number of different outcomes, whether we should just use things like mortality, which might um, prioritize uh, things important for uh, cardiovascular disease and cancer, or whether we should combine a bunch of different um, outcomes to make better kind of phenotypic age predictors. Next. So the second important thing um, in thinking about designing these biomarkers of aging, whether for clinical trials or consumer use, is reliability. So basically, if I take multiple samples from the same person, whether it be on the same day, whether it be a, a week later, do I get the same answer at an end of one level? So this is something um, I work as a bioinformatics consultant with Elysium Health, and they recently put out an epigenetic uh, uh, biological age predictor called INDEX um, for consumers. And it was really important for us to make sure that we were giving someone a reliable answer when we were measuring their epigenetic age. So um, unfortunately, when we actually looked at the existing epigenetic clocks, we found that actually at the end of one level, they're quite unreliable. So this uh, chart is based on nine technical replicates taken from each person. We had eight uh, subjects in this. And this shows a number of different epigenetic clocks that have been developed. This is all done in either blood or saliva. And what you can see is actually, you don't get that good agreement um, in terms of the age that these samples are predicted at. However, um, we've developed different uh, computational statistical ways around this in developing index that have actually really improved the reliability, which we think is gonna be very important, both for consumer markets, but also in clinical trials. If you're saying that your intervention is decreasing uh, biological age by one or two years, that should hopefully be a bigger number than your error rate. So this is really important in that regard. Uh, next. So the other important thing is modifiability. So can we actually develop biomarkers that are modifiable? And um, this is showing some preliminary data. I'm not gonna go into what this intervention is because it's unpublished. But basically, can you apply some intervention and see a change in however, um, whatever biological age measure that you're measuring? Um, and the important thing that I think is still an unanswered question in the field is you can have an intervention, you might see some change in your biomarker of interest, but actually does that impact downstream morbidity and mortality risk? So I think that's really where the field is and I think it'll be really critical for some of these studies like TAME, where we actually have an intervention linked with some of these biomarkers of aging, and then also following up and looking at morbidity and mortality risk in these populations to actually see whether um, these things are all linked up and actually try and understand better, um, Steve mentioned um, causality in terms of the biomarkers. And next. And finally, um, kind of as a last thing, I think we really need to go back and focus a little bit more on kind of mechanism. What are we actually capturing in these biomarkers? It's not entirely clear, particularly with the epigenetic clocks, what, what actually drives the changes in um, DNA methylation that are captured by them. And in fact, um, whatever your intervention is, actually might, you might wanna choose a different biomarker, also going back to those different levels of biological organization based on what you're trying to target. And the only way to do that is to actually know mechanistically what we're capturing. So my lab has been doing a lot of work where we're actually um, in some ways dissecting the various epigenetic clocks. And what we're finding is that they're actually composites of a lot of different mechanistic changes 
that you kind of add up to get your overall clock score. However, some clocks are capturing more one type of mechanism than the other. And it's really important to know um, what these different biomarkers are actually proxying. Um, and this will also help us in terms of identifying interventions that actually might impact these measures as well. 